Awesome podcast show. Hello and welcome to the Animation Fixation podcast show where we talk everything animation. In this episode, we'll be talking about Sergio Pablo's 2019 film, Klaus. The story of Jesper, a selfish postman sent to the remote town of Smyrnsburg, controlled by two warring families to establish a post office and secure his inheritance. Here he teams up with Klaus, a reclusive old toy maker, to meet his mail quotas. As a result, they transform and bring peace to the town and establish the myth of Santa Claus that we all know and love. Scoring 8.1 out of 10 on IMDb and a 95% fresh rating on Rotten Tomatoes, this film was a huge success with audiences and was the very first Netflix animated feature to be nominated for an Academy Award. With its unique style of blended 2D and 3D animation and original story, Klaus sets out to create its own unique look on the origin of Christmas. But did the film succeed in achieving that? Is this film really as good as people say it is? Uh, yeah, it really is. Absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) The first time I watched this film, I knew that it was just going to be one of those films that I would be watching every single year. Added it to the Christmas list, and it's it's (laughs) right up the top there. It's... The thing I love about it is the fact that it's not like all the other stereotypical Christmas movies. You're not hearing all the old traditional Christmas songs and bright colors that you, you just expect around Christmas. It's its its own very yeah. unique look. And one thing that, uh, that really caught my eye was just how Disney-like this film was in, in both mm. its look and also how the characters were animated. And after doing a little bit of research, it turns out that the the director, Sergio uh, Pablos, was actually a Disney animator. So, he, he, yeah, he, he worked on um, uh, Tarzan, Hercules, and there was one other. So he was a character designer and an animator for Disney. And so that really comes through in this film. Oh, absolutely. I was really struck when I first watched Klaus um, how much it looks like a storybook from when you're a kid. Like, it's, and I think Mm. it's the lighting actually. Like, so there's like, there's obviously those really beautiful character designs, the gorgeous, gorgeous uh, animations, but then with this really beautiful um, CGI lighting, it's just gorgeous to see. It, It really pops and these characters really stand out. And then you couple that with the really, uh, paired mm. back backdrops in a lot of cases. Like you look at Jesper when he's in the forest. That is the simplest representation yes. you can possibly get of a tree, but it's just so effective, and it really makes the characters pop. It feels like a storybook, and with the context of this is kind of really yes. like a story that he's telling to his kids. You know, it really it feels so thematically appropriate. It really feels just nice and warm and fuzzy. I like it. Absolutely, and it still brought in the those dark moments those Mm -hmm. dark characters that aren't necessarily evil they're just so stuck in their ways and that they don't want things to change and it's the whole spirit of christmas that's being developed over the the period of this film that brings the the light back into the the characters lives and i just love how unique this whole thing is though i I will say though some of the character Mm. tropes We've seen a million times, like the, the whole lie reveal thing <laughs> with uh, Jasper. That's kind of rolled my eyes at that. Yeah. But yeah, it, it's just a small thing. Yeah, I, I do. I do get what you mean. It it is kind of a little bit. Um, it is a bit tropey in places, but at the same time, the way they've done it mostly works. Like there's mm. there's a lot of stuff that's kind of like yes, quite par for the course like the the two warring families i feel like i've seen those battles play out a million times that doesn't mean that i wasn't interested seeing all the little pranks that they were pulling on each <laughs> other and and I'm, I'm i'm sorry the the, the great mooning still gets me every time i watch this film <laughs> the fact that they've made a model yes. of it <laughs> like yes you should be proud of this <laughs> well done <Yes>. guys <laughs> it's just it's so beautiful and petty and um i <laughs> I really like seeing all of the different mm. characters interact. Yeah. Yep. I did have a question for you, though. What did you feel about the uh, inclusion of the Sami people kind of filling the role of the elves in the workshop? I thought it was ingenious, to be honest. I mean, the the whole story of Christmas and even Santa, 
as a it, it's it's very European, and so having these um, mm-hmm. European people come in and seeing their their influence on the design of Klaus and becoming Santa, I, I thought yeah. it was a, a real beautiful touch, and it it gave it a, a sense of realism. Like the, I didn't find this film to be overly cartoony. Mm-hmm. Like as, as some of the the characters no. and some of their proportions were cartoony, but their their sort of interactions with each other really felt genuine. And so when these people come in and they help Klaus and they're bringing their own influence, it just gave us such a nice touch. And with the design of Santa Claus that we know today, you, you, you look at the outfit that they gave Klaus, it's like, oh, I, see, I, I, I can really see where they're going with this. And it's, it's a believable look. And, and I like that they didn't make him the, the full traditional Santa Claus with the, the puffball hat and the, the purely red and white outfit. Yeah. I, I really like that they gave him his own unique look while still being faithful to the style of Santa Claus that we do know. And it gives a feeling that, okay, this is really where the story and character of Santa really started and that it did evolve over time yes and you know being able to kind of see i i really loved the the little kind of bits of the 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 santa claus mythology uh and seeing how that evolved in the film like just this this absolute game of telephone with all these kids like one kid gets a toy and the next thing all of the kids want a toy and and you know the way these rumors are all started because of you know one wacky hijinks and then it's like oh my god the sleigh flies the reindeers are magical it's just, it's so pure and wholesome yeah. <laughs> and it's, and like, like the whole classroom of kids that all just rock up like, that's how you spell my name? Teach me more things. It was just, it was this beautiful, hopeful view of childhood and I loved mm-hmm. it. I really, really loved it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I completely agree with you. Um, now, with this being a Christmas film, do you think that... It's one of those films that you could actually watch all year round, or would it be something that you would just say, no, this is purely 100% a Christmas story. You know, we should only watch it around Christmas. Do you think it's something like that? Or do you feel that they've done it in a way that you could actually watch it all year round and still get the the spirit and and enjoyment out of it? Well, Tim, as you know, I am bar humbug. um, (laughs) And Christmas is confined to the month of December Mm -hmm. and not one second Mm -hmm. previous or after. Yes. But that being said, I think this this is a film you can watch year round. It's not just a Christmas movie. Yes, it's kind of got this kind of Christmas underlying arc to it. Mm. But in the end, the film is actually about you know, coming together as a community and and the thing that they keep coming back to, one random act of kindness sparks another. It's about being neighborly. It's yes. about, you know, treating people how you want to be treated and just bringing joy into the world. If, if you know, your, your situation is miserable, you don't help it by making more misery. Mm-hmm. You help it by bringing joy. Yes. So I think this is something that people can enjoy year round. This is a Christmas film, but it's not just a Christmas yes. film. Yeah, I, I completely agree. It, it's It's a... A rare exception. Yeah, mm-hmm. Christmas movies like Elf and uh, Home Alone. Yes, they're like the the pinnacle of uh, Christmas classics. But I'm I'm sorry, you're, you're forgetting the Muppets Christmas Carol. That is my go-to Christmas movie. I'm so sorry. I can't believe I forgot that one. Christmas, uh, the Muppet Christmas Carol is what got me into the this um, the story of the Christmas Carol. Mm-hmm. But you know, as much as how great all those films are you feel weird about watching them when it's not Christmas. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, Klaus is definitely a rare exception. Yes. And I think it's because they they haven't done it like a traditional Christmas movie. They they don't have all the the stereotypical things that you expect in a Christmas film. And I think that's why you can get away with uh, watching this any time of year and and still get the message, still find the enjoyment out of it and it not feel out of place. No, I think you're right. Yeah, it's it's definitely something I think... I I know I watch it (laughs) year-round. So... (laughs) And I'm bar humbug, so I think that means other people can too. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Now, what did you think of the voice acting? 
I thought the voice acting was really, really good in this film. I, I love J.K. Simmons um, in general, mm-hmm. uh, and him as Klaus was just absolute perfection. Yes. I don't think he could have cast that better. Um, I was reading that uh, most of Jesper's lines actually weren't scripted. A lot of it was ad lib. Is that right? Um, which apparently so. So um, I'm, I'm quite impressed by that because it flows so well. Um, and I think it really helps to make the character. I mean, obviously, kind of, he starts off fairly unlikable, and you come round to the end to, to actually quite liking him. Uh, and my hat is off to the voice actor for that one because, yeah, he he did a fantastic job of, of portraying yeah. that character. Oh, absolutely. Uh, to, to be honest, I never actually um, thought that the character of Klaus was ever unlikable. Um, I, oh, no, I, yes, but, yes, but not Klaus. Oh, yes, but, sorry, sorry, yeah. <laughs> Oh, no, yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, it was... I mean, also, Klaus is kind of scary at the beginning. He's meant to be the big scary woodsman that, that he just is... thinks he's going to axe murder him. He is, but <laughs> I, I don't know. Like, I found him very relatable, even like, from the very beginning. <laughs> but um, no, yeah, you, you're definitely right about uh, Jesper. Mm-hmm. And they definitely chose the right actor for him and for Klaus. Mm-hmm. But I would actually have to say that I thought that Joan Cusack, as good mm-hmm. as an actor as she is, I didn't feel like she was the right pick for the role because the the character that she portrays, uh, Mrs. Tammy Crum, she, she looks like a, an old, bitter woman. And I just felt that Cusack's voice was too young for the character. And it for me, at least, it, it felt out of place. Did you find that at all? Um, I... Didn't overly. Um, I, I mean, mostly because a lot of the roles I've I've seen and heard uh, Jun Kisaki in mm-hmm. recently, you know, she's kind of been in more of that sort of the the, the crabby crabby yeah. woman role. I love her. I think she's I think she's hilarious, and I think she does uh, very well. Someone that is quite smart and annoyed at the people that are dumb yeah. around her. Like this is this is just th- a great vibe that she gives off, and. I quite enjoyed her performance because I, I, I felt I felt that character suffering as the the, the they're planning to take down Klaus and the, the they're just not getting it. Like you can tell she's the brains of the outfit. Yeah. <laughs> oh look, I, I wouldn't say that the the acting itself was bad. She's oh, a no. very good act a- actress. I just felt that the sound of her voice didn't match the character, at least the design of the character. I can I can I can see where you're coming from with that one. I, I don't I don't think yeah. it uh, rankled me as much, but yeah. Well, that's I can fair see where you're coming from with that one. <laughs> um, I was gonna say I really liked. Uh, it's not a character that we particularly get to see a lot of, but um, the way that they included the wind in mm. in this film as a representative of of Klaus's wife and the way that the wind kind of interacts with things throughout this film, it's really interesting to go through and watch. You know. And the little breezes pick things up and carry things around because this is the representation of of uh, mm-hmm. Klaus's wife kind of guiding him along this journey and the way that it's kind of quite playful but also you know has this really great you feel a lot of love yeah. from wind which is really weird but they've yeah. done it really well so yeah I that was that was kind of one other kind of character I guess that yeah I really, yeah really enjoyed. you know you're absolutely right mm-hmm. about that um it it is an invisible character and yet it plays such an important role in the film we do see this a lot in other films where you have some sort of element that seems to guide one of the Mm. the the lead characters and this one is no different but it has such a profound effect on him because he understands that you know it's it's the spirit of his wife that's that's guiding him and um i don't want to ruin the ending but the the ending i felt was very mm. very appropriate yes. and it hits you right in the feels mm-hmm. and it, 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 even though it's it's supposed to be a sad thing you also feel happy at the same time and I, if i explain why it ruined the ending so <laughs> anyone that hasn't seen this i recommend watching it and you'll understand where I, where i'm coming from so actually calling the wind its own character i think is it's, it's very appropriate yeah and because it is a very important character in this film mm, yes um now another thing one of the standout elements of this film is of course uh, the animation style itself 
Oh, absolutely. What did you think of the style and what did you think of the, the blending of 2D with the 3D? I thought it was gorgeous. It was just beautiful. As I was saying before, like this, it's this real storybook sort of look to it. It really looks like you've stepped into a fairy tale. Mm-hmm. And I, I absolutely love it. Like I, it feels so familiar and homely as well because it, it reminds me of the picture books that I had as a kid. Mm-hmm. And so you feel like you're stepping back into this childhood kind of whimsy and wonder and the characters are just so beautifully designed and they just pop so beautifully against, you know, the, the greys of the town and against, um, against these kind of quite really flat backdrops in the woods. Mm-hmm. Um, and they just pop out so beautifully, and that lighting is honestly gorgeous. Yeah. <laughs> the lighting in this film could be a whole other conversation. <laughs> it really could, and it, it just goes to show how much of an influence and how important lighting really is to a film, regardless if it's uh, mm-hmm. a- animation or live action. Did you feel that the use of 3D was noticeable at all? Um, I don't think for me it was particularly, like, you could tell it wasn't just, like, standard 2D Mm -hmm. animation. Like, there was obviously, like, this extra element that had been added there, which really raised the quality of it. But I don't think it kind of, when I think of 3D animation, I'm thinking of, you know, something like, you know, this really perfect clean lines and, and, you know, something kind of quite polished. And while this was extremely, like well done Mm -hmm. it wasn't what i would typically think of as a 3d animation style so there was obviously something there for me going this is raising it above the rest yep but it was not something i was kind of going oh yeah it's because of this it was kind of yeah (laughs) yeah look uh, the thing that i really appreciated was the way that they were able to i wouldn't say seamlessly but to integrate the 3D with the 2D at a very high level, uh, most people probably wouldn't notice where the 3D model is to where the 2D elements are. So for this film, they mainly use the 3D for characters and and some other props and and things like that. Mm -hmm. But I did notice that they were able to hide the 3D elements well depending on the movement of the camera because they were going for a kind of traditional 2d animated style it's somewhat painterly Mm -hmm. and so when you have the camera panning around a character and you can see the the painterly details on the character's clothes those painterly details they move how uh, textures would move in 3D space, and so I found that when the yeah. character, the, when the sorry, when the camera itself was either doing a very basic pan or even was uh, stationary, that's when the the blending was seamless. You you really couldn't tell, but when you had the the camera flying around, moving around the characters, that's where you could really tell that okay, this is a, a 3D character. But they didn't have too many of those shots, mm. so I could see why a lot of people are still amazed that there's any 3d in it at all as it's only in a couple of shots where it is noticeable yeah did you did you feel um that way as well or did you find that the 3d was quite noticeable yeah i think for me it wasn't so noticeable um yeah there was like you could tell there was something like it was different from other 2d animation that that you know i've seen so Mm -hmm. i could tell that there was something extra added to it um i was going oh it's probably the lighting because that lighting again (laughs) chef's kiss my hat is off to the i have a love affair with the lighting in this movie i don't i don't know why in particular it's just really it's really stuck with me um but yeah i don't think i noticed so much the the 3d elements being added um but you could tell there is something kind of raising this above, you know, your typical 2D animation. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. It, it, you can you can feel the effect of it, but I don't think, for me, it was particularly noticeable how they were achieving it. Yep. Well, on a technical standpoint, it is, they've done a fantastic job because it is quite difficult, especially from a shading standpoint, to get a character to 
to look like it's 2D and to match mm -hmm. actual 2D backgrounds and environments. And especially when you're having moving cameras and the, the characters uh, moving around and such, it is quite difficult to, to replicate that accurate hand-painted line work in your shading. So then when the character or, or whatever that's 3D is facing the camera, that you still have the correct line work on this 3D model. And when it's it's moving around, how the facing ratios and everything like that are accurate so that they're still going to blend seamlessly into the, the 2D environment. So I, I think they did an absolutely phenomenal job with that. Absolutely. With um, especially in in visual effects, we've done our job correctly. If no one can tell that any effects have been done, yeah. and I, I really feel that a good ninety five percent of this film, the shading and texture work were, were done to mm -hmm. to that extent where it's it's very difficult to to tell. Yeah. And coming back to um, your love affair with the lighting, <laughs> that definitely helps sell sells it as well. Oh yeah. Because lighting and shading, they, they go hand hand in hand you, you can't have a great looking character with just good lighting a good yeah good lighting and bad shading or good shading and bad lighting one really has to work with the other for it to be able to sell the the final look the, the lighting's really helping it kind of pop and stand out and and feel just i don't know it, it makes it feel like it's it's alive really but if if you've got you know, bad lighting on, on good shading, it's going to feel mm -hmm. flat. And if you've got good lighting on bad shading, you're just going to, what are you looking at? So yeah, no, yeah. absolutely. So with everything being said, what are your thoughts on the actual story itself? I think it's really cute. I think it's, <laughs> I don't know if there's a better word to describe, but it is, it's very cute. I love stories as well where, you know, people, accidentally fall into doing something really nice where they're kind of a bit of a jerk but then discover that they actually yep. like being nice um so i, I quite liked uh jesper's whole character arc learning that he wants to stay in smirnsburg and and you know actually finding joy in bringing happiness to other people mm -hmm. that was kind of quite sweet and cute and yes it's something that we've seen a million times over but it also didn't feel done to death in this film. Like it felt, it felt quite, I won't say unique. Cause again, we have seen it, but a million times, but it did feel appropriate and it didn't feel out of place. Um, which I think is a big thing. Even if you have a story that you've seen in some iteration or another before, if it feels genuine and if it feels, heartfelt i guess then mm -hmm. i'm a lot more willing to kind of go yeah this is its own story and we should respect it on that merit but yes you know when when something just obviously kind of feels like yeah the story's kind of we're just making a movie just chuck yep. a story in there let's move yep. on with things then yeah that's that's when you kind of start to really feel those tropes and those those repeated storylines yeah Oh, I, I, absolutely. But, yeah, not in this film. <laughs> yeah, no, um, I, I completely agree with every word that you've said. Nothing about the, the story felt like it was rushed or that they didn't consider certain things. I, I, I do feel like they, they considered everything with this film. It felt like that they, they wanted the, the story to be as unique as possible, which is very difficult. I mean, th there's only about, I think, 11 or 12 unique uh, story types or storylines or, or something like that and every other story is an amalgamation of one or the other or just a, a, a complete copy so with that being said I do feel that the writers in this film definitely were aiming to create something as unique as possible and with the 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 look that they've mm -hmm. created for it they did make a very unique film regardless of some of the uh, repeated character tropes that we've seen a thousand times um, you know that that's almost unavoidable at this point. The the story itself, it's it's very memorable. It's you have these great character arcs. Uh, the the character development is is really nice to see. Mm -hmm. it, it, even though if it is a little bit predictable, but you, you like these characters so much that you can forgive it. I think I think the way that they've set up the plot as well that it's kind of the founding of this Christmas mythology 
they can get away with a lot more because they're essentially going, oh, all these things that you've seen in other films, this is where it starts. This is, that is, this true. is the start of everything. So it, it, it makes you presuppose that anything that they're doing in here, oh, yeah, it's, it's original and other people have copied us. Like, you really get... It's, I think it's really ingenious, actually. That is true. Uh, you know, I, because it's an origin story. Yeah, I, I never considered that. That is actually a very good point. Props to class. So there we go. Anyone wanting to, <laughs> <laughs> anyone wanting to tell a story, make it an origin story, and then it's always original. Yep. And th th then you can get away with anything. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely anything. <laughs> All right. So um, we we both obviously really like this film. Yes. But is there anything that you didn't like about this film? Um. I mean, you know, there there are a few moments where you can kind of see. Obviously, people have been a little bit rushed with things. And given that it's such a, a beautiful film, when you notice some of the, the continuity errors or um, some of the little technical goose, you're like, that's yep. disappointing. But, you know, obviously, when you've got so many eyes and so many people looking at this and, you know, all, all of these beautiful details, you don't really mm -hmm. notice them half the time. It's just every now and again, you're like, oh, yep. cool. <laughs> Uh, it's just, it becomes a little Easter egg, really. Like, oh, yes. a, a door just passes through to children wholesale. That's fine. Um, let's not question this. Um, yeah, so I think... I think that was probably the only thing that really, for me, kind of... Mm. Um, yeah, stood out in this film. Yeah, it goes to show when you put a lot of effort into the uh, story, you can get away more with with certain negatives like for me that uh yeah. joan cusack's voice that that did bug me <laughs> but i enjoyed everything else so much that it, it was easily forgivable it's like ah i, I don't really mind the yes. character still has a really cool look about her she, she's um interesting and so you know it, it, it's forgivable I, I will say though that i didn't find this film particularly funny but in saying that I'm actually glad that they didn't go for something super goofy mm -hmm. because I feel that if they went for something goofy, um, it, it, it would kind of take the, the spirit away yeah. from it. It, it. it wouldn't, I don't think it would be a, a classic if they did do something that was super goofy that they're trying to make mm -hmm. all the little kids laugh. There, there was definitely some silly things in there that yeah. uh, got a chuckle, but nothing felt forced. So while while you could say that oh it's not really a funny film you could say that as a negative, I would actually say for this film it's more of a positive. Mm -hmm. It helped it. I completely agree. I think actually one of it's kind of it's not a great funny moment like you know you're not going to get belly laughs out of this film mm -hmm. pretty much. Yeah. But um, one of my favorite moments is just the uh, little petty interaction between some of the neighbors. Yes. And when the kids decide that they've got to start being good so they, they don't have enough on Klaus's mm. naughty list. And they pick the berries and then deliver the berries to their neighbor uh, instead of stealing her berries that day. And so she, you know, in retaliation makes them jam because that'll show them and then in retaliation the family makes her a pie because yep. that'll show her and so just that little people being nice by yes. being petty it's it was for me that was just like the, the humor in this in this film it really just kind of settles in and you're just kind of like this is just cute and sweet like yep. you, you kind of have a little bit of a bit of a grin on your face the whole way through but you're not going to be kind of on the floor laughing it's no. not that kind of film and i think i think you're absolutely right trying to make it that kind of film would have brought it down it would not have made this film and better. I, I think it's like that that sort of humor that you just described i don't think that kids would find that funny that's more for the adults so th this is yes. really genuinely a family film and that kids would definitely enjoy the visuals and the whole santa aspect but the the mm -hmm. it's one of those films that have also been designed for adults to enjoy those sorts that sort of humor would be definitely targeted more to adults we're the ones that are going to find that funny we're the ones that can relate to that that kind of thing yeah so that that's you know more very clever uh, storytelling and filmmaking because if you can get more than one demographic to enjoy this film, then suddenly you've got more more people that want to show it to future audiences, to, to their kids, to their, their uh, friends and, and family. Mm -hmm. 
I think it also is going to add to the rewatch value of this yes. film because you can start watching this as a kid and if you if this becomes some family's Christmas tradition of you're going to watch Klaus, you know, every year as you watch it and you get older, you're going to pick out new things and you're going to find different things to appreciate in it. And so I think that's just, yeah, it's it's a really... It's just a really good film. It is. I don't have a better explanation than that. It's just good. Yes. And, and so with that, what are your final thoughts? Um, This film is very near perfection, and I, I find it so cute and sweet, and it just... I feel better after watching it. It is one of those films hmm. that kind of restores my faith in humanity, and I feel like that's something... In this day and age, we all need a little bit of faith restored in humanity. So... Yep. I, I really love this film. I'm going to give it a 4.8 out of 5. Ooh. So Yeah, I, I couldn't agree anymore with what you just said. It's become a classic. It's definitely up there mm-hmm. with the classics that we're all re-watching every single year when Christmas comes around, but it's got that special place with those special few Christmas films that you could actually watch all year round. It's, it's yeah. got a special place in my heart. I, I love the look. I love the story. I, I love everything about it. Mostly everything about it, I should say. <laughs> I'll, I'll give this one 4.5, definitely. Wow, it's, it's, it's a rare day when I'm nice than you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, that, that, that's the magic of this film. It brings out the good in all of us. <laughs> <laughs> all righty then. Well, thank you everyone so much for listening to this episode and we will catch you around in the next one. Thanks everyone. See you later. Bye.